T thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be back to Riverside. I was a postdoc here between 2009 and 10, actually working with our Yellen back then at the Center for Water Science and Policy Center. Um, I definitely learned a lot. I, I uh, trained as an engineer most of the time hanging out with people who wanted to solve problems through technology and then uh, work with an economist, the famous economist. So, um, you know, and we engineering, we all always say that economists want to solve all the problems through markets. So, so we had a lot of interesting discussions. I think um, the the slope of the learning curve for me was was great back then that we we work. And then later on, I I, I did you know a little bit in, you know work in engineering as a faculty at University of Central Florida. Moved to London, did more policy related work. And, and you know, especially related to my home country because I was I got closer to to Tehran and and um, so over the years I, I think I did some some work relevant to Iran, tried to raise public awareness, change the common narrative about like you know the water problems there, and eventually I got invited to serve there. Uh, and I'm I'm going to tell you a little bit of story. I try to um, keep the um, talk more scientific, but, but I also tell you a little bit about the politics and, and um, you know, how I learned that the real world is, is definitely different. I, I knew it would be different, and that's why like, you know, I've been working on game theory and, and behavior analysis and some of the things that um, have, you know, and through which I've been challenging actually our own field and saying that a lot of things that we say in theory won't work. But, but I, I got exposed to some new stuff. I think I'm, I'm returning to academia with some new lessons and, and, and some new problems to solve. It was a very interesting story. It was a roller coaster, um, um, alive and in one piece. Um, still struggling a lot and a lot of fights on social media. Accusations continue. Our safety is not high and we're still afraid of moving around the world. Uh, but but, but um, that, that also says that you know, good science can be um, can be influential. So if, if there are people who are afraid of your science, that means you're doing something good. So congratulations to us for doing good work. Um, so, so this is the, the riverbed of, of one of the most famous cities in Iran, a former capital of Iran, Isfahan. The river is called Zayan Rud, and the river was there for years. Um, and the identity of that city is tied to, to, to river. Um, the Zayandarud River. And Zayandarud River is one of the rivers that uh, through engineering technologies, the Iranians have tried to um, help and, and a lot of water transfer projects increasing the, the flow of this river, more than double the natural flow, but still this is what we see and I'm gonna discuss why. But, but imagine uh, London without Thames, right? You know, what happens to a city when it, it loses its water? And, and this is pretty much the scene that you know, we are seeing Around the around Iran these days, and it has created a public concern. And and you know, I, I I claim that this is a water bankruptcy problem, and I'm going to talk more about it. But also, like you know, how politics uh, prevent um, solving the problem properly. And 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 politics is not related to Iran only. Like we we have politics, water politics in California. You can see how things evolved. Uh, you know, after the major drought in, in California um, in recent years, we have, we, you know, climate change is uh, related to politics. You can see what's going on, what happened after the Paris Agreement, uh, what the President of the United States these days, you know, says and claims about, uh, about science and, and those things. So it's not like we're not talking about one country which, ha which is separate from the rest of the world and it has, uh, you know, a separate thing. But, but of course, Iran has its own um, unique uh, types of problems in politics that you're going to hear more about. So, so last year in September, um, uh, you know, I got appointed as the deputy head of uh, Iran's Department of Environment. That, that means the Iran's deputy vice president, actually. So the Department of Environment's head is a vice president. He doesn't need approval from the parliament, so the president appoints him directly. And then um, I was in Tehran. Um, the, the vice president called me, and I went to his office. And, and we discussed things. He was talking about the problems, the things that he is seeing and observing, which are new. And, and, and he asked if I want to join. I had one answer only, and that was uh, go check uh, if, if I get approved, because I don't want to end up in jail. That was the only thing I said. I didn't discuss 
didn't discuss like, you know, the, my pay, like my authority and all that. But I, we also said like, you know, I have to make sure that the Imperial College would let me um, have a leave of absence. And, and this is how the discussion went on. I went to London, I got appointed. First, it was a Sunday morning, I got a call. Um, I, was, I was about to pick up the phone, it got hung up, and then I go on social media, I hear like I got appointed. And that's, that's a strange thing uh, that, uh, you know, no one told me that I would have been <laughs> appointed then. And because I went to London to talk and, you know, see what I'm gonna do with my students. I had 10 PhD students at the time. And, and, and thinking about all these things, but then, yeah, I, I've been appointed. <laughs> and then I go to university and say, you know, uh, I'm gonna go to Iran, that thing I told you earlier about, and they're like, okay, but w when does it start? And I said, like, you know, as of yesterday, and I learned it through the news. <laughs> and, and, but, but then, you know, Sunday, actually, I mean, that day was amazing. Like, a lot of happiness on, on, on social media. You know, a lot of people were happy. I'm, I'm probably, I was, yeah, I think, the first one of my generation, the ch children of the revolution. We were born after the revolution of 1979, and all of a sudden, someone from that generation finds a seat at a high level. And, and people thought that, you know, the difference in me and others might be the fact that I've been doing my science, I've done a lot of studies before, and now that someone who, who probably knows what he's talking about might be able to help. And, and so it was a lot of happiness. And that created fear for the hardliners who, who now all of a sudden see someone is coming from abroad and, and a Westerner uh, who, who was supposed to be our enemy and now people are celebrating the return and people are happy and, and what's going on? And one question that I could never answer was like, why the hell do you come back and, and after 14 years? Why would you leave your peaceful life and a good position uh, in, in Europe and come back and want to work in the middle of chaos. So public opinion, how people think, and this is the narrative I never worked on properly. Uh, what do you say? Like, and, and people don't believe it. So if you're corrupt, it's fine. If you're there to rub money, that's, that's, that's what people understand. If, if you're there to, to play politics, they, they understand it. But if you say, like, I'm here to help, that's, that's if. And, and then you, they look at your salary, they look at the, the rent you're paying, and my salary is not even enough for my rent in Iran. Uh, so something is wrong. I mean, to them, it was something was dodgy. Who pays out of pocket to, to serve? Who wants to do all these things? And, and I kept repeating that I came here to help, and, and that was, that was you know, something they didn't believe. But, but I, I really went back to you know, with the hope of returning, creating hope, because I believe that something that we are missing in Iran is the hope for, for a change, hope for improvement, hope for, um, you know, getting results through cooperation, hope for standing on our feet and, and beating those who, 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 who are ruining our country. And, and, and this, you know, this, in, you know, by itself is, is, is a threat to those who have been developing the common narrative and controlling the system. So um, I, I, I bought a ticket so on, on Tuesday night. I arrived in Tehran on Wednesday morning. And being an academic, I didn't want people to come to the airport and pick me up, and I didn't want this special treatment. So I was stupid enough not to let anyone know when I land. Uh, so because I didn't want anyone. But, so I arrive in Tehran, put my passport on again, and, and, and then passport control, I get arrested and, and detained. So right up on arrival, three days later, haven't done anything in politics, I get arrested up front by the hardliners who are the like, you know, anti-government forces. And the power imbalance in Iran is very strange. And, and, and then it starts. So they hack me, they get everything I have, like you know, they open my Facebook, they get 14 years of my email, all details of my life, like my privacy, everything. And, and you know, I think about all the things that they might not like. Of course, I've lived abroad. I'm not the typical, like, you know, hairy guy and, and, and all those things. And, and, you know, what's going to happen? But my thing was, okay, any paparazzi that I would have been worried about is, like, at their disposal. They have access to everything. It's their decision to, to you know, they're the ones who need to think if they want me in this country or not. So after a few hours, the other party of the, you know, the intelligence um, group within the government could, could save me and come rescue me. And, and, and then I got out and ended up in my office. The day after, there is an event pre-scheduled. I was supposed to go there to this meeting as a, a, um, an Imperial College 
a professor and you know I go there under you know just like after a few you know it's it's less than 24 hours in Tehran or like about 24 hours in Tehran I I get accused by some groups as as being the partner of the Revolutionary Guards of Iran who a lot of people uh, believe and it's true that have created a lot of these problems that we are having today, water and environmental problems. But these are the ones who had arrested me the day before and no one knew about it. But you know, I just want to show like, you know, how politics works. So those who had arrested me and, and a lot of people hated them uh, were the ones that you know, on the day after everyone was talking about my partnership with them, right? You know, so everyone was talking about my partnership with those who had arrested me, but no one knew that they had arrested me. So, so it's it, this is like you know how politics work. So same person, I hadn't signed anything, I hadn't done anything, and in, in a matter of few days, there were all these things happening. So people started talking about the spy MI6 guy coming to Iran. The word imperial, even the word imperial, was getting translated, and then you know bringing up a lot of issues that like you know this guy might be connected to the queen. They had like even cartoons of queen sending me to Iran with love and the vice president sitting on his knee with a flower. So all these things without me even being in office. And this, this shows like, you know, the reality and how things are. I still had, had a lot to think about. Um, and, and I was like, I'm, I'm going to stay. Of course, I was getting a lot of promises that, you know, they just want to make sure that you're not a spy, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know, now I've started it. It's something for my generation and I have to continue. Six, seven months later, I have to leave the country and, and then the whole, you know, I, I return with the hope of creating hope. And now I'm, I'm in a position that I am creating, like, you know, I'm making hopeless, you know, people hopeless. And that is sad. And, and um, um, on one side, on the other side is, okay, I went to Iran to, to do stuff, I learned stuff. I was actually a spy of people on the government, I think. And, and uh, you know, not, not the other way, but, and, and, and you know, so now I, I know a lot, and, and I, I, I think I know a lot of, about the roots of a lot of problems, and I, I'm going to continue working from abroad, and that's the decision I had to, to make. And, you know, I can go through the details later on, but it was like a very, um, you know, last minute decision that I could sell, save my life, otherwise, I would have been in jail. And, and some other environmentalists are now in jail, like we were arrested at the same time. So during the whole time I was in Iran, I was getting interrogated a lot of times. I, you know, I got detained for, for you know, three days once in, after a death of one of the environmentalists in jail who um, they're, they're saying who has committed suicide, another university professor who was trying to do things for the environment. And there are still people in jail who the government believes are spies and they have been trying to be in all the protected areas to track the missile activities and the nuclear activities and so on. And this is what, what you get. Like, I mean, this is the level of penalty that you get. So I, I thought that last minute it's best to not to go back at one of the, the end of one of my diplomatic missions and escape the country. Um, so why? Because I think this is my position. I thought this is what I'm offering. And, this is what they thought I was offering because the whole thing was about, you know, when I, I still read everything I've written, I think this is what, what Iran needs to be doing. And, but, but when they read it, they interpret it in the way they want. And it's not only them, it's a lot of people. When, when emotions get involved, when, when politics get involved, when parties' interests get involved, then we have these issues. So I think one of the major problems that Iran has and a lot of other places have, what, the problem we have with climate change and so on, is establishing the narrative of the problem. And it's, this is more important than solving the problem and, and, and searching for the solutions. And this is something we're not paying enough attention to as scientists. We, we immediately want to solve the problem and we think that people know how serious the problem is and they know what the problem is. But the reality is that they don't know. A lot of times they don't know what's, what's going on. So going back to Iran, what, well, you know, how does Iran look like? A, a country which is in, I would say, like you know, mostly semi-arid or arid. So most of the country is, is arid and semi-arid. We, we have you know, so the average of precipitation set to be about 249 millimeters. Um, this is historic. And now we're saying that we are seeing a drop. It's, it's hard because there's not much water accounting going on, but you can see that, like, you know, the precipitation near the coast is, is this is not working. 
Yeah, so the near the coast is, is higher and then we have dry areas and so population distribution, it, it kind of follows the, the water pattern and, and how much, how much uh, we get it in, in rain. Now if you want to look at the numbers of like, you know, 250 is our average, we're getting about, you know, so um, it's about like, you know, 70% of the country is getting less than the average and the, in, in terms of area. And, and that's, that's huge or, or let's say 50% of our area is getting 70% of our, our total um, you know, precipitation. And that means that a lot of areas are, are dry. Now, another issue is, is the temporal distribution. So it's not all a spatial. The temporal distribution also matters. 75% of the water comes off season. And by off season, you know, we mean when we need it for agriculture. So, so immediately, engineers, smart people, think about you know, regulating the timing and, and location of the flow. That means building dams and transferring water. Iran is a country uh, which has been there for a long, long time. How? Um, the Iranians had invented what we call canots, the underground water withdrawal system at the times that the Romans had invented their aqueducts. So if they were trying to manage the water under the ground and they had a lot of interesting institutions around, around managing water on a, on a cooperative basis and, and, and living there for thousands of years. And, um, I think a lot of people are fascinated by the technology and how they were digging under the ground and hitting the aquifer and moving water under the ground. But I think what matters more is, or is the institutions that they had around this. And by westernizing the system, we lost a lot of those institutions as we see this around the world, like you know, how communities get damaged through this. So temperature variation is also um, um, interesting in Iran, we, we claim we have like a four season country at any time, like so you can travel from one side to another and get the climate you want at any given time. And, and, and uh, so some, some areas are pretty hot, especially toward the south in the Persian Gulf. And, and, and then uh, that means high evaporate, evaporation and evapotranspiration, right? So that means that the demand of crops is, is, is high. So, and, and if you wanna, if you wanna grow, uh, food there, you probably have some limits when it comes to rain-fed agriculture. You need to irrigate. And if you irrigate, you run out of water, no matter what. Like everywhere in the world, that, that happens. Eventually, you run out of water if, you, if this is unchecked and you, you go forward. So, so this is the thing that, you know, so a country which is now determined to produce its own food has water issues. And that's something that California is experiencing as well. But, the institutions are different. So looking at the water budget, and, and you know, I, I ask if this is a wrong water budget, because this is another problem. I have seen that a lot of times, a lot of times we're talking about solutions. We go to all these meetings, everyone is talking about what to do. We need a water market, we do need to do this, we need reforms, and all the buzzwords, integrated water resources management, uh, virtual water trade, this, that, that, like, I mean, all, water diplomacy, like all the, all the interesting things that you see, and now Nexus, of course. But, uh, but the reality is, like a lot of times you sit down and at the end it's like, do you guys know how much water we have? And, and that is the, one of the major problems. And no one is interested in look, you know, placing or having more gauges and, and monitoring things because that's not that interesting maybe. But, and, and it creates problems, so metering, understanding, and, and seeing what's going on rather than trying, so, to, trying to solve the problem. So it's like you're taking a patient to the operations room without really understanding what's going on. And, and you want to immediately solve the problem. And it's, it's too late. Like, I mean, by the time you're doing this, you have to do them. So when you're doing that, like, you, you might take the kidney out by, by mistake, or you might do this, you might do that, and that creates additional problems. So for a long, long time, we have been saying that we have 130 billion cubic meters of water, and, you know, in the country. Now what's happening? At some point, like a few years ago, we said, oh, no, 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 we have less than 100. Now they're saying we have about 70. Like, I mean, that's a huge change. I can't believe it because I haven't measured it. And I think we're, we're changing the, the problem because we, have, we, we realize there's water shortage. Now we're questioning water availability and, and, and not, not, our, you know, not other things, not what the, our institutions, not how we use the water. And we try to say, oh, it, it wasn't us. It was like the nature which limited us f further and further. So, so now like you know, 90, 70, all these numbers that you can hear, but if you don't measure, it's really hard to come up with a narrative. 
And one of the narratives that, that the, especially the government was very interested in, and by mistake some people promoted, was like getting too excited. I mean, some, some scientists also got excited about is the climate change thing, right? So climate change is, an, is a scary thing, right? Um, um, I was in Florida, I remember in Florida, we were not allowed to use the term. Um, and, 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 and then we were in a meeting in, in, in California, actually, Iranians and Americans, and I, I realized that like, Iranians, when they talk about the water problems in Iran, everything gets blamed on climate change. And, and, then, and then I remember the Florida thing, and I said, like, you know, when you look at it, both, you know, the Iranians are pushing for climate change. In Florida, we can't do it, but the, 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 object, the objective is the same. Both, both groups don't want to take action on it. In Florida, if I say there's climate change, we have to take action on it. We have to spend money. In Iran, if they deny that there's, you know, climate change is the cause, that, that means they have to re make reforms to the existing system. That means extra cost. So it's much easier to blame the nature for the problems we have there and here to say that oh, nothing is wrong, don't worry. See what Trump is, is claiming these days. It, of course, if you take climate change seriously, it, it costs you jobs, it costs you, like, you know, some money in the short run, and, and, and that's something that the politicians don't like. Why? Because they have a four-year term and they want to maximize things it, you know, in, in that term. And this is true, I think, about like, almost all politicians, that they have objectives, and, and they have to follow their objectives during the time they have. And that's why, and, and people forget, like, I mean, now everyone is talking about climate change, but go to people and say, pay carbon taxes, pay this, pay that, pay that, would they do it, right? And, and, and this is the, what the politicians don't like because it costs them, uh, you know, n not re getting reelected. And, and because in the short term, people, that's like, you know, the housing price and the market and this and that determines how you vote and your voting behavior. So, so this country with all these complexities um, is, is interesting because when it comes to some of the infrastructure, the country is very advanced. In, in terms of urban water, for example, we have had like about 99% or even more um, coverage. So, so, uh, so good quality water for a long, long time. Not anymore, we are, we are seeing problems, but, but the, you know, a lot of investment in, in infrastructure and, and the urban water sector has been good. The rural sector, not, not that good. And, and now we're talking about 70% urban population, 30% rural population. That's also a big shift in Iran, which is not healthy and that has caused a lot of problems. So the rural water supply is not that good. And then when it comes to wastewater co collection, we, we are not that good. So that means that there, the country has not thought about wastewater as a valuable resource. So wastewater is great. It's not healthy, just get rid of it. So, you know, the, the way we have been doing our calculations has been till the, the use of water and then flush and put it in uh, under the ground. And that's, that's how we are. We don't have really sept septic tanks, but we have these systems where you just let the swear go, go down and infiltrate um, to your um, aquifer system. So, so now this is something which you need to shift. But the problem of the developing world is the fact that they want to repeat all the mistakes of the developed world. And this is, this is terrible. You know, for someone who has been here, like in California, seeing all these problems, right? We have dams, you have water transfer projects, and you know, you cause problems in the Delta if you're using water in Los Angeles. So all these things that you're seeing, and, and you, you're reviewing this history, say, dam building, water transfer, um, desalination, and now, for example, a city like San Diego is so interested in wastewater reuse. Why not like just bypassing and starting with wastewater reuse rather than repeating all the things that the West has done? But but then mindset is is this way. It's like talking to your ch children and telling them like you know don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Like I made a they want to experience it themselves. And a lot of the time it's like oh you did all the things you liked and, and now it's my turn. You're you're blaming. And this is these are the discussions we get in in also in in the develop you know in in for example the debates on climate change. So the developing world has the valid claim like you know ha an argument that you know now it's our turn to develop and you're telling us not to 
you know, industrialize our country and that's, that's gonna hurt our economy and so on, so on, so we're not guilty what, for the problems created. And so the, all these inequality issues that you have. And the debates are valid, but it's, you know, they're not complete statements. And that's another thing, that a lot of things we hear about water and environmental problems are valid, but not complete. So, so now what we see around the country, a lot of cases like this. Lake Rumia is very in interesting and important in, in, in the recent history of I Iran because um, this, I, I think, was a turning point in, in, tr in terms of public discussions on, on environment and environmental awareness and even like response of the, of the government. So this is, this is the hypersaline lake in northwest Iran. It was the la largest in Middle East. And, and it experienced what, you know, the RLC syndrome. Uh, limit the water inflows to this salt lake. Why would you let, you know, fresh water go into your salt lake and, and become salty? And then other things, building a bridge and all the things you see in, you know, in Utah and in Cal, you know, so the, the, the salt lake and, uh, and so on. So similar problems. And then this, this big ecosystem is, is gone is gone, like, I mean, and now we're talking about doing things about it. And, and so for a while, this was a political problem because this is in a Turkish region. The Turkish region is more powerful than some other, some other areas. And it was becoming a, a, a something very political and a lot, you know, some people arguing that this was done on purpose, blah, blah, blah. But now what are we seeing here? So blow up, you know, dust and salt. And this is something I believe, I mean, I try to push this in the U, you know, to some of the UN meetings and, and um, you know, settings. And fortunately, we have now something. We're going to have something for, for um, especially East Asia. But we are going to see the dust, uh, I think, dust storms as one of the most important uh, environmental tragedies of the 21st century. I, I strongly believe in this because this problem is something that we're seeing in, in the global south. In, um, in because all these thoughts about like, you know, wetlands are not that valuable and let's use the fresh water, put it into use, beneficial use of, of water, and this is what we are seeing. So now all the people surrounding this area are suffering from, from, from dust and salt and it see, even goes, can sit on their, their, their agricultural land and stop it. Uh, stop, you know, you, they have to stop farming. Now, everyone is talking about this problem. We have a, a large restoration task force on it, but you can't achieve much because you're locked. Like, you know, there are people who have their businesses going around this. And now this argument about taking water from urban areas and from agriculture and giving it to environment is still a tough thing, even in the United States. So imagine how hard it is to do that in a place that where people's lives might be dependent on agriculture. So, so this is on the surface, and we are seeing this in a lot of places. Under the ground, remember, Iranians were really relying on the underground water, and they had that system. But then there was like, you know, in modernization, increase in, in you know, uh, the agricultural growth of the country uh, resulted in, in introduction of pumps. And, and we also had some land reforms where the, the Shah of Iran decided to give land, like, you know, to kind of get the lands from big landowners and give it to the farm, poor farmers who were working for them. And then that means, that meant breaking down all the, all the traditional institutions that we had. Because now we have all those people who were working on their a cruel uh, ruler or manager having their own lands access to pumps and can dig their own wells. So not anymore, it, you know, they were interested in, in managing their, their canots who were really hard to manage, to dig. A lot of people died under the ground for digging them. And now tragedy of the commons. Pump, 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 pump. And then it got worse over the years because these lands got smaller and smaller. Now people are inheriting these lands from their parents and every, you know, their, their father had like, you know, 10 sons and now like we, we have 10 pieces of that original land. And these things getting smaller and smaller. That means like, you know, more and more decrease in efficiency. That more like means more water use for less pr and, and less productivity. And th this is what we're doing. Under the ground, we're using more than what 
what is available. And of course, you see a big drawdown and a lot of new pr problems like land subsidence, sinkholes, and the things that we, we didn't have in Iran. And, and, and now, but still people are interested in digging like thousands of meters. Now they're saying that we have found like some fracture water the depth of 1,000 meters. I was fighting against this when I had a position, and of course, that's one of the reasons that the Revolutionary Guards didn't like me. But you know, now that's what they're doing, 1,000 deep, and, and saying that, oh, this is fractured water. It's renewable. We, we get so, so a lot of basins. We, in a lot of basins, we have like you know, it's it's forbidden and prohibited to to dig more wells. But we have about 750,000 legal wells, and we have issued permits, and about 250,000 illegal wells. Um, and, and it's an issue. Even if the legal wells go more than their quota, we have actually, we are monitoring a lot of these. We have given permits, but we have given too much permits. So like, you know, the, what you have given is more than what you have available. You have given credit to people, but you don't have enough money in your bank. So surface water, our checking account exhausted. We went out after our, uh, Groundwater being our saving account and our save coming to us from our ancestors and what we inherited. So both are, both are now gone. So um, I think, you know, this to me is a water bankruptcy situation. Simply, no matter what, what caused this, the amount of available water in the system is less than what you're demanding from it and less than what you're consuming. So you are using your you know, what's, what's left under the ground and everything is getting dried up uh, on the surface. But, but then, you know, so forever we have been talking about water crisis. I myself have been using this term. And a few years ago, I, I started saying, no, 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 we cannot call this a crisis anymore because I myself wrote up my first water crisis pa paper when I was an undergrad. And I, I've recently found even like short episodes of like, you know, black and white movies from years back and they call water crisis, they use the term crisis. But crisis is, is something extreme. It's, it's limited in, ter you know, in timing. And then it means like everyone should get together and solve the problem. It's not happening. The other important thing about crisis is, is the fact that when you are in a crisis, you are hoping and, and thinking that you can restore the system to a good extent. So in a crisis mode, crisis management about restoring the system, about mitigation. But I think we cannot mitigate everything in this problem. We cannot restore many of our ecosystems. So crisis is a wrong word, and it's denial. It's like climate change. Can we only concentrate on mitigation? No, because the cost of adaptation also keeps rising. If, if you live in denial, this is what you get. So you go around the country. All these problems, central Iran, a lot of tensions. Now southwest of Iran, dust storms. This is a new problem. We didn't have dust storms. Dust storms, when they come, they, they, dust sits on your electric grid. You lose electricity. Electricity is down, then water, water utilities stop working. So a dust means no water, no, no electricity. And once people are out on the street, water is not their problem anymore. They, they're like, you know, they now want the government to be taken down. And, and that is why now, all of a sudden, the Iranians are getting so sensitive and nervous and paranoid about environmental problems, thinking that, oh, Kava Madani has come back to do a revolution. That's a question I was getting a lot of times, right? That, oh, you know, water wars, this and that and that. And, and those who, who talk about these things, I think, still don't understand what the main problem is. And they're thinking about the surface. But we have people who get now crazy about water transfer and, and you know, kind of blow up some of the pipes and, and a lot of other issues. So agriculture, in terms of agriculture, like we are doing worse and worse. The efficiency is going down and we are producing, you know, I think wrong crops. Summer crops are very interesting and appealing to the farmers. We even export like watermelon to, to the Arab countries. I mean, watermelon is big and fat. It doesn't mean that it takes a lot of water, but, but still something that people are very angry about. That Like we're losing our water to the other countries and, and we are you know, water short ourselves. What, what other crops, but, but, but then this is, well, like you know, we, we're not going, doing that good in the saffron market, which is a high value crop, and we have the, you know, we're famous for it. Pistachio, we have been beaten by California and Israel. And, and, and so the high value crops, we have lost them like internationally. And then like, you know, everyone is interested in cucumbers and tomatoes because it's, it's, 
you know, quick, quick money for the farmer. So you know, the market is not working. So this is a water bankruptcy system. And when I started this argument, my whole point was that we have to adapt as well. So part of this is our new normal. Climate change has an impact. You know, bad management has a more significant impact. So anthropogenic changes, but the issue is that you cannot restore groundwater level in the short run. You cannot restore many of these things in the short run. So, so rest restoration and adaptation matters, and as, as long as you don't admit the fact that you're water bankrupt, you have made mistakes, your institutions are wrong, and you make, make big reforms, you're, you're in trouble, you're in denial, and yeah, crisis, 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 let's hope that the next year won't be dry. And that's how the system is managing getting managed at the moment. I've been there, I've been sitting in these meetings trying to argue things in a different way. You know, it's, it's hard. But, but this is something that I've been working on and that's why a lot of people don't like it because when they want to build more dams, my discussions are there or, you know, and then now more people. And that's another thing. Once you have a new thing, once you have a new story, once you have a, you know, a new narrative and you explain it in a simple language to people, people would repeat it. And there would be other people who come and, and, and you'll back you up. And that's a challenge to those who want to build more dams, who want to transfer more water, who want to you know, cl do cloud seeding and so on. But let's look at the, the causes. What, what is causing this? So Iran has a, like a very rapid population growth. So about the revolution time, we had about 35 million people. Two decades after, we had, like, the population got doubled up. This is my generation. So the government was interested in population growth and promoting that, like ideologic, um, I think, shifts in, in the country, more, getting more religious, and so on. And, and then that meant for us, starting with, with the like, milk crisis as, at, 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 you know, when we were babies, and then going forward, the schools didn't have enough capacity for us. So they had to run, you know, increase the seats and, and then uh, train more, teachers and, and, and then run schools in different shifts and so on. And if we go forward, then this goes like to the entrance exam to the university. Crazy, like, you know, very populated, not enough seats, not enough professors. So we start new schools for training professors, send, you know, people abroad to get trained, increase the seats, but it's hard. Now then there are no jobs. We continue studying, right? A lot of us are doctors for no, because of the lack of jobs. And I, I'm sure there are a lot of Iranians here. Uh, and, you know, people migrating, escaping from reality and, and then marriage issues a lot, you know, because once you tweak the population distribution, there might not be enough, enough uh, you know, older men for, for women because, uh, you know, normally that, that's how it used to be, it used to work that women getting married to older men. So, so, so a lot of things and, and lack of jobs, but it, these people also need resources, right? And if your economy is not good, to create jobs, you use more and more natural resources. Now you know why I get into trouble for this stuff I, I say. But the simple thing about this is that per capita water availability drops. Believe it or not, I've been into meetings where people argue, how is population related to water? And, and why? Because the ideology says that right now they want to increase the population to 150 million, arguing that our generation doesn't have a backup population. This is a valid argument. This is something that, you know, China experience, for example, but if you don't have, re if you don't, if you can't handle 80 million people, how are you going to handle 150 million people, right? And and then what is it, where is this coming from? Yeah, I mean it's it's a good country, but you have to be able to to manage. You have a lot of resources, but you're not you're failing in in managing this. But this is not the whole story because per, in per capita water availability, we're still still, I mean, compared to the rest of the region, doing okay, but the population. It's now 70% urban population, all concentrated in some major metropolitan. So we don't have medium-sized and small-sized cities. All these people go there. And once everyone is settled here, they're powerful. Southern California takes water out of Central Valley somehow, eventually, or Delta. You cannot just tell people to move out. You have to feed them. So that means that you can, like this area competes with the rest of the area around it and keep you know, bringing more water. Vegas, for example, right? So you transfer more in water. So that means damages to all the ecosystems around and so on. So that's another thing, that the population distribution 
is, is not helpful to the country. Um, inefficient agriculture. This is also a very important problem. So Iran went through a revolution, but also like Iran, like other countries in the Middle East, has been always nervous about its food security. This is the valid concern for all countries in that part of the world. Israel, um, Iran, you know, Turkey, uh, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, now see what happened to Qatar when they went under sanctions, they, didn't, they couldn't import food. See the like you know discussions in the in the when I watch the videos of the Shah of Iran in the 70s, all the arguments always like when when they give a hard time on on the oil price, his response is like how about the wheat price, right? So this battle of energy for food and last years of Saddam, like you know food for energy, food for oil, is is this is like you know something that a lot of countries want to avoid. They're not that nervous about energy. Um, they don't have interest in renewables, but they have interest in food. So a lot of these countries, like Libya, Egypt, like all of them, have tried to increase their productivity, use water in any way they can, and they have inefficient agriculture. Um, but this conspiracy is there. That, like, you know, we, we want, we, other countries want us to be dependent on them, and we, want, we don't want that. We have to produce more and more food. But the Iranians have failed in, in terms of food production. So um, they have seen a growth in, 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 in cereal production, sure, that's good. But with that, if, if, you, if that's a top priority, yes, keep producing it. But the mo most, you know, uh, the increase in water use has continued with the improvement in technology. This must have not happened. But the reason is that water goes to the wrong crops a lot of times. That are not, that doesn't mean more security. But one important thing is, yeah, in the past, 30% of the GDP was coming from this sector. But, you know, now it's 10%. I don't think you can get much out of this because the state of the economy is different. 10% of the, of the Iran's area is, is getting, um, you know, farmed. Uh, and, and then, but it, this is, I think, this is the problem. That's it. 20% of the jobs come from this sector. This is the poor community. I mean, this is across the MENA. It's Middle East and North Africa. Jobs are coming from this sector. And as long as your economy is not powerful and strong, you need to bribe people with water and land. And people need to farm. Otherwise, they migrate to cities. This is what's happening. This is what happened in, in Syria and elsewhere. They migrate to cities, and then you have pain. So, so when, when a lot of people were fighting, like, you know, we have to shut down the agriculture sector, my argument was like, do you understand? Like, we, if we don't have jobs for them, they migrate to cities. They, if they're, you know, economic inequalities, these people living in suburbs, we have had revolutions, we have had, like, you know, chaos, tensions, and, and, and so on. And this is what we are seeing now, a, a significant growth in migration. So uh, the farmed area, like, you know, rain-fed area and, and irrigated area are, are about the same in terms of, air, you know, so how, how much land is going under these, but the yield is, is significantly different. So about like 10% of our, our food comes from rain-fed agriculture. Now, you know, we can definitely do better, but, but still you, want, you have to irrigate if you want to use more, um, if you want to produce more food. So low efficiency, I mean, the efficiency is low, and that's another problem that we're having, I'm going to talk about, but you know, that people think by solving the irrigation efficiency, they can solve the problem. So all these myths about, like, you know, by, by increasing the irrigation efficiency, all the problems would be solved. By having a water market, all our problems would be solved. By raising the prices, everything would be solved. So heavily subsidized agricultural sector, because we were dealing with the poor, poor um, community, poor portion of the people. These are the people who vote. These are the people who have been traditionally supporters of the government, and you don't want to mess with them. Like anywhere on earth, agriculture, you know, farmers are strong. So, so, you know, soil quality and land quality, when we look at it, a lot of places in Iran don't have really like suitable land according to international standards. So that means, again, you have to irrigate more and more and more if you want to produce food. So in a lot of these areas, we should not be like, you know, we have central Iran, we're growing rice in central Iran. It's crazy. It's insane. And the government has, the government has not been able to stop rice growth in this area that it's, according to standards, is like unsuitable. You should not even farm there and do other things. But, or, or like, you know, if you're farming, then, you know, don't grow these crops or use, I don't know, greenhouses and so on. 
but like we transfer water from an area which, is, which has a high, higher land suitability to central Iran, which is politically more powerful, and we grow food there. And, and these, I mean, if you would do, in, in California, you would do, see the same. So, so it's not unique to Iran, but it's just the fact that you're not willing to change it, it you know, is problematic. They're, more, they're interested in transferring more water there. They're now interested in transferring more water from, you know, desalinating water and, and pump it, like, you know, moving it for 600 kilometers. This is stupid, like, to anyone. But, but then, then you have people there. What are you going to do? And in a short term, we, we want to solve these problems. These people go crazy if I raise the prices tomorrow, right? If, if you know, let's have sympathy for that. And the country is under sanctions. The country is under chaos. Now, like, you know, JCPOA, the nuclear deal is gone because someone has decided in DC that this is not a good deal. So, so your country is going through chaos. When you are into chaos, when you are in crisis, you just want to respond quickly. Quick fix solutions are what you like. And then is it easier to put a pipe there and work with a few contractors or go and work with 20% of your population? It's always easier to go with engineers. So 90% of the water goes to the agriculture sector with a limited return. Industri industry get gets less than 2%. That means that, like, you know, if you look at this distribution, you know, put California aside, look at the European this to, you know, allocation of water to their different sectors. So if you take, once you spend your, your water in the, in the industri industrial sector, then you, can, you get a more you know, added value for every drop that you're, you're spending, and then you can buy food easily. And so, so the poor countries provide food to the strong economies who have water too, right? So the Europeans have a lot of water. Why, why are not they you know, using it? So of course, rain-fed agriculture also is, 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 is more productive there. But this is something that the poor economies are suffering. And you, if your economy is not good, you, don't, you cannot produce jobs, new j alternative jobs. And this has been my argument a lot of times, that forget water. Water is a byproduct of another major problem, and that's our economy. And, and as long as you cannot solve the problems out there, you cannot do much. So, so this is the distribution now about 55, we are saying that 55 billion cubic meters or like about 55% of water comes from, the, from, from under the ground. That means like you know, more and more dependence on underground and, and now we are seeing water quality issues under the ground and so on. So, and the other major thing, and I think this is even bigger than the other problems, is the thirst of the country for development and the perception of the term development. This is, again, around the world we have seen this. What is the meaning of development? What is sustainable development? To a lot of people in the developing world, development means more concrete and more steel. And, and this is the issue that we're having. Middle East is now very interested in highest building, largest mall, biggest this, biggest that, and so on. And, and because they, they, they understand, because this is what gives them confidence. This is what, like, you know, so everything is external, exposing yourself. Whereas, whereas to, to a Scandinavian politician, this might not be the meaning of development. So your society doesn't understand the development well, your politicians don't understand it, and, and then you do what, what people like. People in your city might get much happier if you have a high-rise building or a big tower that they can be proud of, whereas, like, you could spend your money on having bike lanes, for example. Which one is more attractive to the general public? Definitely the towers in, in Middle East, still with all the problems we're seeing. So to get reelected, these are the things we, we do. So the thirst for development increased with the, you know, increase in the oil price before the revolution. This is some part of the problems that the Shah of Iran had, like you know, standing against the, the rest of the world. And then it continued after the revolution with all the things which happened to the country, country going on the, under the war, having, a, having added revolution, want to stand on its own feet and so on. Thirst for development meant that you know, the part of the development is building more dams. So Iran became the third dam builder in the world. And you know, these are not groundwater wells. These are dams. Like everywhere we wanted to build a dam. Every parliament member wanted another dam to be built in its air, his area or her area. Why? Because it means more jobs. It means a boost to the local economy. People get happy. Land prices go up and so on. And then build and build and build and build, and, and then you don't have enough water. So a lot of these dams are now empty. 
We, we even have building Big Dam, which is a, the first probably like, you know, major salination plant. It, it takes water, you know, we have a, it, it's on a salt bed, so a huge amount of water goes into this, this dam, this reservoir, and, and gets salty and comes out. And, and they're locked, they don't know what, what, what to do with it. So all of these is because water is never about water. I think, you know, water is not water. Water is everything but water. Water is, is jobs, water is economy, water is pride, water is dignity, water is like independence, water is food, water is energy. So, so and all these things. And, and you know, when it comes to problem solving in the water sector, we are interested in cubic meters. Whereas like, that, that's the least thing which matters. Like, I mean, why do you use water? What do you need it for? And this is something that our engineers have failed to understand. A lot of those who provided solutions to the problem didn't understand well. So it's a complex problem. We're sitting on, on one of these nodes being it's water or like it's some surrounding, but it's a complex system. It is interacting with everything else in the system and, and complex systems, so, you know, complex human nature systems, like you are facing with the bounded rationality problem. Um, you, you never understand these systems. Uncertainty is really hard. You have you know, all these causal relationships between these things. It's hard to predict them. Well, you, you get revolutionary and evolutionary behavior. So it's really, really hard to, to, to so, you know, solve problems because once you tweak something here, you get an unintended consequence elsewhere. And this is what we have seen. So, so the whole argument is just, be less arrogant and admit the fact that you don't know enough about your system. So Isfahan is the city I told you about. We, we see, saw a big urban growth, agricultural growth, industrial growth, so second industrial basin in central Iran, high agriculture growth, urban population, now the third populated city in central Iran. And then it had all the problems, like you know the competition between all these things. So they decided to transfer more and more water. So through multiple water transfer projects, they have more than doubled the, the natural flow of the river. But this is what you're seeing most of the year. Now, after all those transfers, why? Because they never thought about limiting and understanding the other side, which is demand. I mean, if some years ago, and this is one of the actually studies which got popular in Iran and helped changing the narrative. So we did all this big, this big modeling effort, like you know, a lot of complex modeling, but this was what I was presenting out of that whole modeling exercise. And that was, you know, when I look at this complex system, this is what we're seeing. We, we have water scarcity and we try to solve it through interbasin water transfer. This is, this is Southern California too. Um, so you try to balance it. That's how engineers solve problems. Now, something that you don't per pay attention to is that once an area is attractive, people move to it. Once you provide water, you have more development. And once you have more development, your demand is increasing. So this, this fix that backfires. You have pain in your body because of infection. You take painkillers instead of antibiotic. And your infection gets worse and worse. Your pain goes away for a few hours. And your body might collapse eventually. So, so this is what like, we are doing you know, curing the water symptom, addressing the water symptom rather than the main cause. Inefficient, you know, um, increasing irrigation efficiencies and other things. They're investing a lot of money into increasing irrigation efficiency. While we, like, you know, those who work in this, this area know that increasing irrigation efficiency means less recharge and means increased water use for it, for, as long as you cannot control it, as long as you cannot give them quotas and, and and, and limit it, but it's because of the limited understanding of the complexity of the system. And if you go on social media and see like the things about water, everyone is talking about the need for this. So, so that's, that's how you have a complex system. You create all these competitions between the elements. Corruption becomes another issue. You, infor, you, know, you place some, some, some boundaries which don't make sense. You try to superimpose uh, political boundaries to watershed boundaries and then that's what you get. And we have an, in, you know, it's like a, in every, every, every decision must be made in Tehran. And then, you know, so it, once you have this hierarchical system, you will have corruption. You will have, like, you know, decreased efficiency because the decision being made in Tehran is not necessarily appreciated in, 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 the, in the region. So a lot of things, so a lot of, you know, side things and side business and in interest in, in building and doing things and, and doing the more expensive stuff. 
So competition and conflicts is, is, is nothing unusual for this place. And then this is what I'm saying, like what we decide in Tehran will fail because we don't bother talking to those who are affected by our decision. Um, this is, I think, my most important finding in, in politics was that I was always this, you know, one of these university people was very proud of working or like, you know, interacting with the policymakers, briefing this minister and talking to the parliament members and so on. But I, and I was doing things with people, but I never, you know, was proud, I wasn't that, wasn't that proud of that and I never put that in my tenure package. But, but this is the fact that like, you know, once they know about the problem, the thing is different, and that's what I was doing, working a lot of things with people. Do we have climate change? At least what we see on, the, on our data is that, yes, Iran is getting, ha, you know, is getting more drier, like you know, projections say that, and we're, at least in the last few years, we have had a major drought, but, but is that the cause of all problems? No, I mean, so we also have political instability, sanctions, bad economy, people want to maximize their immediate benefit, and all these things which are catalysts but not the main causes. But a lot of times we want to fix these things. And we blame the problems on these things. So, so that's, that's also like you know, how emotions come into play. They, they tweak the narrative. A, a lot of fights which are counterproductive happen, and that's the reality of the show no matter where you are. And I think both sides, you know, if you're a decision maker, you think this is your case, and, and you're here. And, and I think the policymakers also think they're here and, and accuse the other side of being emotional, not understanding reality, and so on. And, and yeah, the complete narrative is not there. We are fighting a lot of times over wrong stuff. I have got accused of trying, you know, I was labeled a water terrorist, but because I, you know, they say I tried to create a dark image of Iran's water problems, shut down the agriculture sector, make the country food dependent, and import food. So that's my water terrorist label. There is another label by a terrorist that I sh shut down the agriculture sector. So the water terrorist was about, yeah, and then forcing people to migrate to cities and they carry guns and do a revolution and kill each other. But the other one is, is about importing GMOs and destroying the next generation of Iranians genetically. And, and, and while in all my arguments, I always said we should not shut down the agriculture, agriculture sector. But they pick up part of your narrative, part of your story, and then they go from there. Food security is, is important and matters, but it should, if you put water, food security against water security, then of course, you know, you, it's a trade-off. It's an important trade-off. Do you care about food or, or you know, uh, water security or human security. Human security is the most important element that we're a lot of times missing. So I think it's, we don't necessarily need the state, like you know, the most complex solutions. Uh, we don't need the most complex um, technologies. We, we need to change our understanding of the problem. With simple tools, we can develop useful solutions. And I think, you know, I have, a list of like you know a, a ten strategies that Iran can take for for improving the situation there are in papers, but this is what I try to to always say that unless we dare solve this problem through diversifying the economy, the country as long as we don't decouple Iran's economy from water, at least social and political economy, we cannot solve the problems. We need to admit we're bankrupt and adapt to the situation. Raising awareness has been tremendous, like, you know, has had a huge effect on the discussions today, but what we are missing is empowering the farmers. You can have two, two, you know, two types of solutions. One is that these guys are poor, they need more support, let's subsidize them and, and give them more subsidies and, and take care of them and see what, what's happening to Iran, or say that, Empowered farmers can make better decisions. And this is something we don't do because if you're a politician, do you want more empowered farmers who have a louder voice or those who are poor and dependent on your subsidies? So I think with that, I, I end my uh, conversation, my, my talk. And there are, I think there is one, one uh, documentary by Al Jazeera on Iran's water. And there are two publications on Iran's water bankruptcy and crisis that if you're interested, you can read. Thank you. Thank you.